OK. All right, uh, hi, everybody. So today we are going to start with calculating MOSFET currents. Uh, the objective for today um, overall is uh, right here. Uh, last time we talked about um, uh, the, the MOSFET, right? We gave an introduction to the MOSFET. We talked through some of the basic concepts of um, inversion and how the MOSFET behaves as a switch. So I'll touch on that real quick. And then today we're going to talk about the energy band diagram. So last lecture focused more on the uh, uh, the physical model of what's happening. So give you a physical intuition of what's happening in the device, how MOSFET behaves as a switch. And today it's going to be more about the energy band model. So um, I, I want you to think about the correspondence between the two models, because I think that's very important. Both models describe uh, the phenomena in the MOSFET, things like inversion, accumulation, cutoff all those concepts, it describes it in two different languages, but they're both trying to explain the same, the, the same concept. If you see the correspondence between the two languages, that will make your understanding much deeper than it would be if you just understood one language uh, alone. Okay, so really quickly, uh, let's just touch on uh, what we uh, went through last time. We basically said MOSFETs are very important because we make a ton of them and they uh, they have two really important applications, digital switching and amplification. Digital switching is used in computers and amplification is used in wireless uh, radios. And those are the two most important things that are in our cell phones and uh, Wi-Fi devices, all of our electronic devices these days. We talked about Moore's law and then we talked about the structure. We said there's an, um, two types of MOSFET devices. There's an NMOS and a PMOS device. Uh, we talked about the IV characteristics, about how you'd operate a typical MOSFET. You first apply a gate voltage. If you want to turn the device on, the gate voltage has to be greater than the threshold voltage. And then uh, you vary the VDS. And so the IV curves look something like this, where you have a bunch of curves for different values of VG. And of course, at VG equals zero, uh, there is no, no current at all. Then we got into talking about the um, we got into talking about uh, how a MOSFET controls current. And this is the most important concept that we talked about last time in class. Okay, the concept of electronic switching looks like this. When the transistor is off, the channel region, the channel region, meaning uh, the, uh, the region just underneath the gate um, is a certain type of semiconductor. And when you apply voltage to it, that semiconductor flips to the opposite type. So let me give you an example. In an NMOS device, the source and drain are N-type. The substrate is P-type. This is the top view, by the way, just so no one's confused. This is a top view. So we're looking at uh, the gate, uh, the channel region just underneath the gate. Okay, when uh, the transistor is in the off mode or cutoff mode, this, uh, this is an N region. The channel region is a P-type substrate. And then the drain is an N-type region as well. So from a circuit's point of view, this looks like two back-to-back -back diodes. And what we said in class last time is that the, the diodes only conduct current in one direction. So if you have two back-to-back -back diodes, no current can flow. But um, in order to turn the transistor on, you basically have to somehow switch this gate region from a P-type to an N-type. And when you switch it from P-type to an N-type, now your circuit model looks more like this. You just have three resistors. You don't have a PN junction anywhere that's blocking the current flow. Okay, so this is what allows current flow. Okay, we talked about this, the physical structure of the MOSFET. This is the side view of the device. And we said that there's a substrate region, there's a gate on top of it, and there's um, an insulator, and there's a metal a polysilicon uh, uh, material there. And uh, the key concept in inversion was that we apply a positive potential to the gate. That builds a positive charge. It creates an electric field that goes that points from the gate into the substrate. That does two things. It pushes away the holes. It pushes away the majority carriers. And then it also pulls in electrons. It pulls in the minority carrier. And so the interesting thing that happens is that just underneath the gate region, uh, you invert the material from P-type to N-type, right? Because N-type means you have lots of electrons, very few holes, and a P-type is vice versa. So by applying a field, you've pushed away the holes in the p type material, you've pulled in the electrons, 
And that effectively switches it, inverts it from a P-type to an N-type uh, material just underneath the gate region. And this is done just by applying a voltage to the gate. So you can very quickly create this inversion channel and uh, create a conductive path between the source and the drain. So this allows you to turn on your device very, very rapidly within, you know, within picoseconds. All right, so in the triode region, we said that um, uh, the, short, so the short of it is, is that um, the left side of the channel is more conductive than the right side because the channel voltage on the right side is higher than the left side. That means uh, uh, there's less uh, voltage across this uh, capacitor here. The less voltage across the capacitor means less charge. So that's why this side of the inversion channel has less charge than the other side. And um, I'm not gonna go into all the details of this uh, because we'd get into a really long discussion about it. In the saturation mode, um, that the right side of the channel has, has a very little charge to the point where it gets quote unquote pinched off. And this happens when the drain to source voltage is greater than VGS minus the threshold voltage. In the saturation region, that's the flat portion of the curve where the, uh, the current does not increase very much uh, even as you increase VDS. It becomes relatively independent of VDS. Then we went through and we derived the current in the triode region, okay? Multi-step process here that involved the integration um, through the length of the channel. We split up the channel into small chunks and we figured out the current voltage relationship in each one of those uh, little chunks. And then we integrated to find the total IV characteristic. And so we came up with an equation for the resistance of the MOSFET in the triode region we also came up with an equation for the, uh, the current of the MOSFET in the saturation region. And then finally, we just uh, described the differences between the PMOS and the NMOS device. Okay, so we covered a lot of concepts uh, last time. So I'd like to start off with today is um, just a quick problem on calculating MOSFET currents, uh, just so that we're all on the same page in terms of being able to do the problems. Um, so I'm going to start with this. Uh, so this problem is asking us to use the equations in the triode and the saturation regions of operation and uh, calculate the currents. OK, so um, remember the IV characteristic looks uh, something like this. VDS is on the x-axis. The drain current ID is on the y-axis and the symbol looks something like this. This is an N-channel MOSFET. So the gate is here, the drain is up here, and the source is down here. Okay, the way that we operate an NMOS device is that we apply a VGS. This is the positive terminal. It's applied between the gate and the source. Then you also apply a VDS between the drain and the source. The VGS is between the gate and the source. VDS is between the drain and the source, and the current ID flows through the drain, through the channel, into the source. Okay? So what we're being asked to do here is that um, uh, calculate the current under a couple different conditions. So the electron mobility is 200 centimeters squared per volt second. What is electron mobility? It has to do with how fast the electrons can move uh, through the channel. And we've learned things like, you know, electron mobility depends on uh, things like scattering, uh, what type of the material it is, how much voltage. Well, it's not dependent on voltage. It's dependent mainly on the scattering mechanisms within the semiconductor. Higher mobility means electrons can move faster in response to an electric field. Uh, the gate oxide thickness is 10 nanometers. That's the thickness of the insulator just above the gate. Uh, that determines a lot of the important properties of the diode, including the capacitance of the diode. Uh, threshold voltage is 0.6. That's usually determined uh, empirically by experiments once the MOSFET is manufactured. And then the width is 25 microns, length is one micron. So let's talk about what this is. Um, I'm gonna draw <coughs> what the MOSFET looks like in the side view first. The side view, we can draw the MOSFET like this. 
So this is an n-channel device. So the source and drain are both n-type. And there's a p-type substrate here. Okay, the gate region is like this. So there's a gate oxide, and on top of that, there's the gate metal. Okay, so the 10 nanometers, the gate oxide thickness refers to the physical dimension of this layer, the gate oxide. And so it's saying here that uh, the gate, gate oxide or T ox is equal to 10 nanometers. Okay, that's the physical thickness of the oxide. Now, the other dimensions, if we go to the top view, let me just erase this, put it up a little bit higher. I'm gonna show the top view now. This was a side view and here's the top view. So if we look at this uh, device from the top view, the source, is actually gonna look like this. I'm gonna to try to line it up with uh, the other image here. Okay, this is gonna be the source. This is gonna be the drain. And then on top, in between the source and the drain is the channel region and sitting just on top of the channel region is the gate. So we can call this the gate. Okay, uh, so the current in the side view, it flows, the electrons flow from source to drain, the current flows from drain to source. So in the top view, the electrons are flowing like this. Okay. The reason I'm showing you the top view is just to illustrate the dimensions of the device. This is the length. The distance from source to drain is the length of the device, L. This dimension here is the width of the device. So the designer, whoever designs the MOSFET device can control L and W. And, L and by controlling L and W, you can control the current and voltage characteristics. Okay, so that's what the W and the L mean. All right, the first part is calculating the drain current when VG is five volts and VD is 0.1 volt. What region of operation are we in? Uh, can someone in the class tell me what region of operation are we in? It's either, uh, cut, well, it's either cut off triode or saturation? Triode. Triode, that's correct. And, and uh, what's the rationale, Melvin? Um, so we're, um, that, when I said that, I assumed that the source was at zero volts. So um, the, 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 v, the VD is larger than um, the VG minus the threshold. Exactly, good, good, yeah. It would have been appropriate to say VGS instead of VG. Uh, Melvin, thanks for that. Um, so VGS is greater than VT. So that means we're uh, not in cutoff. That means the device is on. All right, then the next criteria you're gonna look at here is uh, you're gonna see, notice that VGS minus VT VGS minus VT equals five minus 0 0.6. This is equal to 4.4 .4 volts. Okay. So you can uh, compare VGS minus VT, this number, to VD. And you see that VGS minus VT is larger. So VGS minus VT is larger than VDS. This means we're in the triode region.
Okay. So if we're in the triad region, we're going to go back and use the triad equations here. Mu n c i w over l, v g minus v t times v d minus v d squared over two. Ah. Okay. All right. Now, um, one little point I'd like to make here: the CI is is has units of uh, it's a unit capacitance. So CI is equal to epsilon of the oxide divided by the thickness of the oxide. This formula, we're going to just put a box around this because this is an important one. You're going to need to know this for your homework problems. CI is a unit capacitance. And the way that you figure out this is uh, the epsilon of the oxide is equal to the relative dielectric constant times, here, let's just put epsilon zero, epsilon r over the thickness of the oxide. Okay, so uh, with the oxide, let's take a value of uh, relative dielectric constant value of 3.8. Okay, and epsilon zero is fixed, 8.85 times 10 to the negative 14 farads per centimeter times 3.8. So the epsilon R is gonna vary depending on the material that you're working with. Oxide, you could say, say it's 3.8. Um, and then epsilon zero is fixed. So the thickness of the oxide here is 10 times 10 to the negative seven centimeters. Notice that I said uh, 10, 10, 10 to the negative seven because um, you're converting, uh, you know, 10 nanometers is 10 to the negative nine. So if you convert that to centimeters, it's 10 to the negative seven centimeters. So that's where that's coming from. And uh, if we do the math real quick, Okay, this is going to give you 3.36 times 10 to the negative 7 farads per centimeter squared. Okay. Okay, so our mu n here is 200. I'm not going to put in the units just because I'm trying to save space here. But just remember that all your units, the length for your units has to be in centimeters. So just be careful about that. This is centimeters squared per volt second. Uh, now we're putting our CI, which is in terms of farads per centimeter squared, 3.36 times 10 to the negative 7. The W over L ratio is 25 divided by 1. OK. The VGS minus VT, 4.4 .4 times uh, VDS is 0.1 minus 0.1 squared over two. 
what you'd find is that this, uh, this second term is actually quite insignificant, but we're just putting it in there for now. Okay, so this is going to be equal to 7.3 times 10 to the negative four amps. Okay, so that's a typical uh, calculation. Now, um, let's go on to the next part here. Calculate the drain current when VGS is equal to three volts and VD equals five volts. So we have to ask ourselves, what region of operation are we in now? Can someone tell me? So we know just like before, we're not in cutoff. We're in saturation. Correct. Good, thank you. And uh, rationale? Because um, VDS will be greater than VGS minus VT. Exactly, good. So VGS minus VT is equal to three minus 0.6. So this is 2.4 volts. Okay, so we definitely have a situation where VDS is greater than VGS minus VT. So saturation. You have to use the saturation equation. So in saturation, the current is equal to one half mu n C ox W over L VGS minus VT squared. Okay, so notice in the uh, this equation, the equation for the drain current in uh, saturation mode, Just pulling this up here. There's no dependence on VDS, okay? Notice there's no VDS in this equation, okay? This is because uh, in the ideal model of the saturation region, the uh, drain current is independent of VDS. As we'll see later that actually this is not entirely true if we take into account uh, the early effect or the short channel effect, okay? But for right now, we, are just, we will just use this equation. So this is going to be one half times 200. We've already calculated our mu n, 3.36 times 10 to the negative seven. W over L. And then we calculated VGS minus VT already is 2.4 squared. I will go ahead and do that calculation real quick. All right. This is four point eight times 10 to the negative three amps. Okay, so um, if we want to draw this out in the end, we, we don't have to, but um, uh, you know, I'm just giving you a sense for what the IV characteristics would look like. If a VGS is equal to five volts, let's say this is, uh, five volts here, okay? So in the first part, when VGS is equal to five volts and uh, 
VD is equal to 0.1 volts, uh, we're in the uh, triode region of operation and the current is um, 0.73 uh, milliamps. Okay, so we're gonna be, or let's say right about here. And because we're at, we're actually in the first part of the triode region where we're applying a very, um, sorry, did not do that right. Okay, when uh, VGS is equal to uh, five volts, VGS minus VT is equal to 4.4. .4, so saturation is gonna start at 4.4 .4 volts. Um, so the IV characteristic for that is going to look something like, the saturation is gonna start here. We're gonna be in that part of the curve. And uh, we'll get to the second one in just a second. The, the uh, drain current when VGS is equal to five volts, VD is equal to 0 0.1 volts. So uh, part A, we're right about here, well in the triode region. So this is part A. And this is the curve for VGS equals five volts. Part B is when VGS is equal to three volts. So it's gonna look more like this. And the onset of saturation is going to be uh, three minus 0 0.6 around 2.4 volts. So about here is where it's gonna to start to flatten out. And below here, it's gonna look something like this. And the operating point for this one is when VGS is equal to three volts, VD is equal to five volts. So we're operating it way out here. Okay. So this is part B, different parts of operation. Okay, any questions on this problem? All right, good. All right, now let's continue on to the uh, new material. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw energy band diagrams. We're gonna start with the energy band diagram at equilibrium, and then we'll go on to the energy band diagrams in other regions of operation, okay? Remember, again, like make the correspondence between the energy band diagram that you see here and uh, uh, the physical model. So equilibrium in this case, for an NMOS device, an enhancement mode NMOS device, NMOS at equilibrium means cutoff. Okay, we're not applying any voltages uh, to the gate. We're not applying any voltages to the drain or the source. And we're looking at what the energy band diagram is in that case. We know the device is, is going to be off, but let's see what the energy band model tells us. So drawing an energy band diagram, you're gonna be using some of the same rules in your tool set uh, that you did with uh, the other, <clears throat> um, uh, that you did with the diodes, okay? So the first rule is that at equilibrium, uh, no discontinuity can appear uh, in the Fermi level. So the Fermi level is a horizontal line across. Okay, so you start by drawing the Fermi levels here, okay? It's just a flat horizontal line. I've left out the part in the oxide. That'll be clear in just a second why. It turns out the Fermi level is not really relevant in the oxide because it's an insulator. Um, but the point is the Fermi levels in the metal and the semiconductor have to both be a flat horizontal lines at the same level. Okay, next step is that you would draw the metal uh, portion on the uh, left side of the semiconductor. Uh, and then the semiconductor on the right side. Now, one thing I wanna clarify here, um, this is sometimes a point of confusion for the students. Um, wh where are we drawing the energy band diagram? Because the NMOS is, the device looks like this, right? This is the source uh, and the drain here. And then there's the gate here. 
Where we are drawing the energy band diagram is through this cross section here, okay? Not the horizontal cross section. We're looking at the vertical cross section. The vertical cross section consists of a metal, then it consists of the oxide, and then it consists of the semiconductor just underneath that. Okay, so just to totally clarify, we are looking at the vertical cross section. Okay, so let's pick up where we left off here. So the metal, the top layer is going to appear at the left of the band diagram, Fermi level here. Uh, and then uh, the oxide in the middle, and then the semiconductor, the p-type substrate on the right side. That's the bottom here, the channel region. Okay, so we start by drawing the metal uh, on the left, and the metal only has uh, the E0 and EF. So just as a reminder, we did these kinds of drawings when we were looking at metal semiconductor junctions. Metals, they don't have a prescribed conduction or valence band. The Fermi level typically appears within one of the bands. And for that reason, that band has a lot of carriers and a lot of empty states. So it turns out to be quite conductive. The concepts of conduction and valence band are less relevant to a metal. So we don't bother drawing it. The way to think about a metal is that um, if the Fermi level is within the band below the Fermi level, you have lots of electrons and above the Fermi level, it's relatively empty. And then there's also a free electron level, E sub zero. The free electron level is the energy required to eject an electron from the metal entirely, okay? That's a photoelectric effect. And so the work function of the metal is the energy required, uh, the difference in energy between the Fermi level and uh, the free electron level, Q phi m. Phi m is the work function of the metal. Now we draw the oxide. And the oxide is an insulating material. Insulating materials typically have very, very large band gaps and they don't have any carriers. Carriers cannot flow through them. So the concept of a Fermi level is not really relevant to um, an oxide, at least in the context of a MOSFET, it's not relevant. So we don't even bother drawing it. Okay, the oxide has no carriers. So we just draw it as a region like this. The next step is drawing the, the p-type semiconductor on the right, the channel region. And here, uh, again, you at this point, you've drawn many uh, diagrams, energy band diagrams of semiconductors. So you should know at this point how to draw the conduction, valence, intrinsic level, and, the, and even E sub zero, which is the, the free electron level. So I'm just gonna draw, the, uh, draw it kind of step-by-step step for you. The first thing you do is based on the doping, Based on the doping, you can calculate the distance between EF and EI. And that we call it Q phi F. Okay. I just remember this is a new terminology. Phi F, this Q phi F is the distance between EF and EI. Okay. This is determined by doping. We know this from module three. Once you know the, uh, the location of EI, then of course you can draw EC and EV. So this all comes from the doping. And uh, the next step is you have to draw the E sub zero, the free electron level. Okay, and the way that you can do that is you start with your conduction band where your E sub C is, and then uh, add the electron affinity, which is chi sub S or X, X, it looks like an X, so X sub S or chi sub S here, that's the Greek letter. Um, and for silicon, this is fixed at 4.05 electron volts, 4.05 electron volts. 4.1 electron volts, I'm sorry, for, um, in silicon. Okay, um, so once you've positioned your EC, then you can also position your E sub zero because you know there's a 4.1 electron, electron volt difference between them. So now the right side of your diagram is, uh, is complete. The last step is to connect E sub zero from the left side to the right side. Now you're, you're gonna notice something that this diagram, there's really no connection that needed to be done. E zero and E zero were both at the same level, okay? This is kind of like a simple case where you have what's called a flat band. The, the system is flat banded at equilibrium, meaning there's no bending in the E sub zero. This is not always true. In fact, most of the time it's not true. 
We'll get to this later when we talk about the flat band voltage. Okay, but if your E sub zero is at a different level than the E sub zero of the metal, then there's gonna be some bending of the band diagram. Okay, but we'll get to that in a little bit later. Right now, I just wanna show you the simple equilibrium uh, band diagram. Now it comes to analyzing the band diagram. How do we wanna think about the device at equilibrium? Well, um, the, channel, the channel region, this is the area that we're most interested in. What's going on in the channel region? Uh, you can see that the channel region is p-type at equilibrium. The Fermi level is far away from the valence band. I'm sorry, the, the Fermi level is closer to the valence band than it is to the conduction band. Sorry about that. So it's p-type. And so you can think about there being a lot of uh, holes um, in the valence band here. But those holes really have nowhere to go. Okay, they see an energy barrier here, the oxide. And the way to think about this, you know, you can think about it in terms of an energy barrier. You can also think about it as that from the physical level that the holes, um, there are lots of holes under here, but the holes can't go into the metal or anything like that because there's an insulating material in between them. So that's the diagram at equilibrium. Okay, now this is what the diagram looks like in the book. Same thing that I've drawn here. The Fermi levels on the left and right side, you have the intrinsic and conduction band and valence band. This is the final band diagram. I just showed you in the previous slide how to do it uh, step by step. Okay, so this is just a, a reference. Okay, now uh, I'd like to show you uh, what happens at accumulation. We did not talk about the accumulation mode last time in class. Okay, accumulation mode, it's, it's a mode where um, you accumulate more majority carriers uh, under the gate. And the way you do this in an NMOS device is that you apply a negative gate voltage. Okay, remember like last time in class, we were saying, well, in an enhancement mode NMOS device, you have to apply, if you wanna turn the device on, you have to apply a positive voltage to the gate. And we'll get to that in a second. But right now we're, we're saying, well, what happens if you actually apply a negative voltage to the gate? Can anyone think of what would happen? Let's draw this out real quick. I think this is a good thought exercise. Okay, so this is your gate region. So what's gonna happen if we apply a negative potential here? Let's think about this step-by-step. Step. This is a P-type substrate. What kind of charge buildup are we gonna have on the gate metal? Negative charge. Good, negative charge. And what, what direction is the electric field going to point? Um, it'll point towards the gate. So towards the gate. The P, P to the exactly. Gate. So the electric field is going to be pointed in the upwards direction. If the electric field is pointed in the upwards direction, what's going to happen to the carriers, the majority and minority carriers in the channel region? So I'd imagine the uh, P-type, um, the the majority carriers will go towards the um, interface. You got and, it. And um, the minority carriers will kind of go towards, I guess, the rest of the substrate. Yeah, that's away. right. Yeah, the minority carriers will get pushed out and the holes will get uh, pulled in. That's right. I haven't shown the electrons in there just to, for less clutter, but um, the, the major effect that happens is that a lot of holes get pulled in. So you've made it even more P-type than it was before. So that's obviously not gonna give you a conductive channel between the source and drain, but nonetheless, we like to draw the energy band diagram of it just to, to um, you know, build our understanding of these different modes of operation. So accumulation mode refers to the accumulation of majority carriers under the gate. Um, in an NMOS device, this can be achieved by applying a negative gate voltage. So that's what we just did here. The rule is if you apply a negative voltage on the metal, this is an energy band diagram rule, by the way. 
if you apply a negative voltage on the metal, EF on the right side of the diagram goes down relative to the left side. Okay, remember it's the opposite. And whichever side has a higher potential has the lower Fermi level. Okay. All right, so what you see here is uh, the, uh, the NMOS junction. This is what the band diagram looked like at equilibrium. Okay, so what I wanna show you here is that the entire right side of the diagram is going to move down relative to the, relative to the left side. So um, just watch this animation here and so you can kind of see what happens here. Okay, I'll just show that to you again. This is, the, this is the mental model I would like for you to have. Imagine that the entire right side of the diagram at equilibrium, now that now you're no longer at equilibrium, so the Fermi level on the right side has to be lower than the Fermi level on the left side because this side has a lower voltage on it. So the entire right side of the diagram moves down. The Fermi level moved down and all the other ones moved with it. Okay, so now we're in a situation where you can see that there's a discontinuity in E sub zero, okay? When we, um, just to give you a little bit of context, remember when we, um, in a PN junction, initially when we put the two materials together and the Fermi levels, we lined up the Fermi levels, the two bands were not connected. And so we said, well, the bands have to be continuous. That's also true in this case. E0 has to be continuous. Remember the metal doesn't have EC or EV, so we don't need to do anything about those, but the E0 has to be continuous. You can't just have a sudden drop here like this. So what ends up happening is the bands bend, the semiconductor bands bend like this. And this is what that looks like. I'll show that to you again. The bands curve up like this. Okay, when E0 curves up, the other bands do as well because the distances between the relative the bands always has to remain the same in a particular material. So when E0, EC, EI, and EV, they all curve up. Now we can kind of analyze, well, what's going on here? Um, out here, it's the same as before. It's still a P-type uh, P-type semiconductor. But the difference is this, is that the holes, the holes can always move back and forth, right? But here, when they move, let's say the holes move to the left, the holes will actually get trapped in what's called a potential well, okay? Now let's, let's think about why that happens again, okay? This has to do with drift currents. In energy band diagrams, drift currents are represented by the rules that holes like to move up the slope and electrons like to move down the slope, okay? So in this case, you can uh, you can see that the holes can they can always the holes can always move horizontally and so can electrons. But once they get to this point, the electric field is going to pull them in and trap them in this little potential well just next to the channel. That's how they get trapped there. Okay. So do you see the relationship between the energy band diagram? and what's happening in the physical model. The physical model, you see the holes get pulled in and there's a whole bunch of holes that are built up just underneath the channel here like this. And that is exactly what is shown in the energy band diagram. The slope in the band diagram represents an electric field. Okay, we know that there's an electric field uh, buildup, especially close to the gate oxide. Out here, the electric field is zero. So out in the P-type substrate, the electric field is zero. The, elect the strong electric field happens just underneath the gate oxide. Any questions on this? This is the accumulation um, mode. Yeah, go ahead, Melvin. You had a question, um, I guess, uh, the, the oxide, would it hold any of the electric field at all or the electric field at the right side of the oxide or the bottom of the oxide and the uh, um, I, I didn't quite get the question. You, you said the electric field on the right side of the oxide? Uh, yeah, so the, left? Uh, well, the, the oxide, which is like the, the insulator, would, would, would it hold any electric field at all? The electric field is actually, uh, most of the electric field is contained in the oxide. 
okay, okay. There's just a little bit, little bit of the electric field that leaks out into the semiconductor. Okay, so the vast majority of it is in the oxide. Yeah, I see, I see. Okay, yeah, so, yeah. Because, because kind of just an electromagnetic, uh, a rule in electromagnetics to kind of like a rule of thumb to kind of pick up here is um, dielectrics are good. They're good at supporting electric fields. That's why dielectrics make good capacitors, capacitor materials. Mm -hmm. You can have a strong electric field in a dielectric. You cannot have a strong electric field in a in a conductor. In fact, the in a perfect conductor, the electric field is always zero. Yep. Now, in a semiconductor, a semiconductor is something in between a conductor and a non-conductor, right? So the semiconductor can support um, electric fields somewhat. Not as well as a dielectric, but it can. So is so, that like? Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, is, it, is that like I guess part of the the energy band diagram where um, where we're used to like in the PN junctions we say you know a certain slope in the energy band diagram corresponded to a certain um, electric field, um, but now when we're looking here at E zero on the left side, E zero on the right side, um, the vast majority of the slope is on the semiconductor, and that's right. We 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 don't represent any any slope in the oxide because it doesn't have any levels or it has a very large band gap. So um, I, 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 I know what you mean that the oxide can kind of hold an electric field. I just, and kind of looking in terms of the energy band diagram, you know, how do we know in terms of, you know, a band bending? Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, actually if I, with, with the oxide, we'll see in some of the diagrams later that the energy band diagrams do actually have a slope through them. See, I see. Okay. The oxide right. has a slope through it to indicate that there's a strong electric field in the oxide. I see. Okay. I just didn't include that in this diagram because I'm just trying to cover like one concept at a time. Okay. But this is a very good question. Thanks. Okay. Yep. All right. Let's continue then. So in depletion mode, or we apply a positive gate voltage. Uh, can everybody hear me? I just want to do a double check. I just had a message saying my internet connection is unstable. I can hear you. Okay. You broke up for a second there for me, but I think it's better now. Okay, good. Yeah. So we are applying a positive potential to the gate. So that means we have positive potential here. The electric field is pointing this way. And so in this mode of operation, remember the, the in the depletion mode, we're applying just a small voltage. The small voltage is enough to push away the holes. Okay. But we, an important point I want to make here is that we haven't applied a strong enough potential to pull in the electrons, not quite yet. Okay, so the most of the effect is pushing away the holes. Let's see what that looks like in the energy band diagram world. The depletion mode refers to the depletion of majority carriers under the gate in an NMOS device. Depletion mode is achieved by applying a small positive potential to the gate. So you have a small buildup of positive charge. Uh, a moderate, you know, a modest electric field going through the gate oxide into the semiconductor region that pushes away the holes. Now in an energy band diagram, uh, the way that we think about it, we are applying a positive potential to the gate and a negative potential to, this, uh, to the channel region relative to that. So that means that the channel region or the semiconductor region, the Fermi level is going to go up, all right? And so just like before, I have the equilibrium band diagram that's currently shown here, but I'm gonna show you that we, what you wanna think about is moving the entire right side of the diagram up. So just imagine it's all sliding up like this. Okay, I'll show it to you again. Initially, the Fermi levels are at the same level at equilibrium, but when you apply a positive potential to the gate, the right side of the diagram shifts up. There's a difference in the Fermi level here, this dotted line, and then this dotted line. The difference between them is actually the applied potential. 
or very close to it. Okay. So just like before, um, when you have the differences in the band diagrams, you can't have discontinuities in the relative bands. So we have E0 here and we have E0 up here. So there's a clear discontinuity where my mouse is and that, that can't happen. So there has to be some kind of bending so that the bands are continuous. And uh, so you're gonna see some bending downwards like this. I'll just show what that looks like, okay? And see it again, this is what it looks like before the bending. This is what it looks like after the bending. And now we can go on and analyze what is happening here. Uh, P-type semiconductor. So we're more interested in what the holes are doing, all right, because there's a lot of holes. We draw the holes out like this. And this time you can see the way, the way that we've drawn them is there are, are um, the holes that are very close to the, uh, the, the, um, the gate oxide, they actually get pushed away. So this is quite different from the diagram that we looked at earlier. Accumulation mode, the holes were kind of collecting up into, um, into this region uh, just before the uh, uh, channel. And now instead they're getting pushed away. Why is that? Notice the slope in the band diagram is this way, okay? So the holes like to go up the slope. Drift current for holes means holes like to go up the slope. So the holes go up this way, okay? This correspondence, this corresponds to the physical phenomena that the electric field is pushing the holes away from the gate oxide. So here the, the holes are getting pushed away by the electric field. And so what happens here is that it leaves behind a region that is less P-type than it was before less p-type than it was before. How do we know that? This is another little, another little detail in the energy band diagram. Look at the distance between EF and EV. Okay, this is a typical p-type semiconductor, right? <clears throat> at the interface, at the interface, you can see that the EF is farther away from EV. So, um, and in fact, EF is almost to the point where it's crossed, it's crossed over EI, okay? So here the EF is pretty close to EV, this is P-type. Here EF is farther away from EV, it's less P-type. And you could argue that, well, this almost looks like an intrinsic material because EF and EI are in the same place. All right, so the energy band diagram actually tells you a, a lot of information. Okay, so um, uh, in the depletion mode, the physical model again is that you, you have holes that have left the area. So there's a depletion region here, but you haven't pulled in the electrons yet. So there's no conductive channel yet. Okay, and the final diagram, any questions on this diagram before we go to the inversion diagram? Okay, good. Um, okay, thank you, Melvin, for that comment that I just saw the chat that you sent earlier. All right, let's go to the final one now. The NMOS at inversion. Um, it looks like I have some old chicken scratch diagram here. So I'm gonna cross this out and draw a clean one. Um, let me draw it up here. Okay, that's where we did the other ones. So this last mode that we're looking at is inversion. Now inversion is actually the same as the last, what we looked at on the last slide in terms of the potential. So we're applying a positive potential to the gate and that builds up positive charges in the gate there is an electric field that's pointed downwards in, into the channel region, okay? The difference is just how much voltage we apply, okay? Inversion mode refers to the accumulation of minority carriers under the gate, we'll get to that. Um, but the way that we get the inversion mode is by applying a large, a large positive potential to the gate. 
When we apply large positive potential, there's a large buildup of positive charge, a large electric field, and that electric field now does two things. It pushes away the holes, and it also pulls in electrons. It does two things. It's strong enough to pull in those minority electrons. That's physically what's happening. So let's look at the energy band diagram. Again, if you apply a positive potential on the metal, the EF on the right side of the diagram goes up relative to the left. So same thing, you're gonna see the right side of the diagram going way up like this. The difference from, from the uh, previous slide to this one is that notice that the right side has moved up quite a bit more than last time. This distance is larger. than the previous diagram, okay? So there's a larger difference in Fermi level, so there's going to be more band bending than there was in the previous case. And the band bending looks like this. I'm gonna show you again, this is what the flat lines look like. After you do the band bending, it looks, uh, looks like this. All right, so now, let me just erase this extra ink here, so it's so less clutter. So now when we look at this diagram, you could see some interesting things happen. Of course, the, uh, let me just get to the, on. of course the, the holes that were here, they get pushed out, okay, just like before. So there's still depletion region happening you have this electric field here. There's a slope in the line here. So there's obviously an electric field. In fact, the electric field is stronger than the last time because there's more bending. But the key difference is this. Okay, we've pushed away the holes, but at the same time, there's also electrons that have been pulled in. Okay, and for this one, we actually have to consider what's happening in the conduction band. This is, this is a P-type semiconductor, right? So before we were like, well, let's focus on the holes, what the holes are doing, because there's many more holes than there are electrons. But we can't forget about the fact that there are also some minority electrons up here. These electrons can move in either direction, but if an electron happens to get to this point, the electron is of course going to go down into that potential well. Electrons like to go down the slope. That means the electron is drifting in opposite direction of the electric field. So as a result, the electrons get pulled in by the electric field and then they stay there. This little thing is called a potential well. You know, you think about like getting stuck in a, in a drinking water well. This is like the electrons get stuck in that little potential well. Okay, so Physically what's happened, and you can see that by looking at the location of the Fermi level, notice that the Fermi level is above EI. EF is above EI. So this means you have inversion. So out here on the right side of the diagram, EI is above EF. So this is clearly a P-type semiconductor. But at the interface, EI is below EF. So this is now an N-type semiconductor. Okay. So the holes got pushed away, electrons got pulled in, the bending of the diagram actually now tells you that at the interface, the material is n-type, but out in the substrate region, it's still p-type. Okay, any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I kind of just, just thought about this is that, um, so near the interfa inter interface, we're turning this um, interface into uh, n-type. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the substrate is still p-type, so it's effectively giving us a p-n junction. 
Does that no. mean that we have a <laughs> depletion region and different depletion widths and everything like that, similar to the? Oh, great question. Yeah, in, in fact, there there is a depletion region wherever you have. This entire zone is actually a depletion region. You've depleted the minority, uh, the majority carriers. So, in fact, we'll, the next few slides will talk about the uh, depletion region. Okay. All right. Thank you. You'll get that today, and maybe we'll get to it uh, in class next time. Yeah. So uh, you can see the slope in the in the diagrams here. It looks kind of like a PN junction, doesn't it? A depletion region. Um, in fact, it, it's called a depletion region because you've depleted a, of the majority carriers. The depletion region forms, but in addition to that, an inversion channel forms. So there's two effects happening. Okay. So to summarize, here are the different modes of operation. And these are some uh, diagrams from the textbook. The accumulation mode of operation, this is when um, the Fermi level uh, on the semiconductor side is lower than the, uh, um, the metal side. There's an electric field. Um, and Melvin, you had asked about the slopes in the oxide regions. So these diagrams actually do show you the slopes of uh, E sub zero in the oxide regions. So this tells you there are strong electric fields in the oxide. So accumulation mode, uh, you apply a negative potential to the gate, uh, you end up getting a uh, buildup of positive charges in the channel just underneath the gate. Um, in depletion mode, you are applying a positive potential to the gate. And so the Fermi level on the right side of the diagram goes up. Uh, this pushes away holes from the channel region. And if you apply a, a large positive potential, then you'll not only get this depletion effect pushing the holes away, but you'll also pull in the electrons into this potential well. And that's when you've it, it inverted the material from P-type to N-type. So now that we've talked about what happens at inversion, now we have to start getting a little bit more quantitative. So what exactly happens at strong inversion? So um, we have to first define what inversion is, what, what is strong inversion? And this slide is, gives the, the textbook a definition of what that is. In order for us to effectively invert um, the semiconductor from P-type to N-type, we have to have a certain amount of band bending. Okay, we can actually quantify that. We can say that, well, in order for strong inversion to happen, the amount of bending has to be equal to two times phi F. So remember, this is determined by your doping. Right, the distance between EI and EF is determined by the, P the substrate doping. So that's what determines your Q phi F. And remember like the phi F, I'll just say so, KT ln of NA over NI, right? So that determines this portion of the energy band diagram. We need to apply enough potential so that the amount of bending is twice that. So, this is equal to two times phi f. Okay, if we do that, then we've essentially created an n-type material where the number of electrons at the interface is equal to the number of holes in um, out here where the semiconductor has not been affected by the electric field. We've created a mirror image of that material, kind of think, way to think about it. So that is strong inversion. So now we're going to look at the more of the physical model of what is happening uh, during inversion. Okay, what does the charge distributions look like? And so we've drawn many diagrams of that already. So you have a general sense, but now we're going to get into some more of the quantitative details of that. So the structure, the vertical cross section looks like the metal. Then you have the uh, gate oxide, which is an insulator. 
and then you have the semiconductor substrate underneath it. That's where the inversion channel is uh, going to be formed. Okay, so now if we get a little bit more quantitative and detailed about this, we have to think about the properties of each region. So the metal, the gate metal, so far we know that the gate metal has a work function phi sub m, that's the energy required for an electron to be ejected from the metal. So that's a classic property of the metal. Then with the gate oxide, we know that it has, um, you know, we calculated at the beginning of class today that it has a dielectric constant, a relative dielectric constant for silicon epsilon of the oxide is 3.8. That tells us how well the material supports an electric field. Or, you know, if we want to get into the more technicalities of it, has how polarizable the material is. Um, that's a discussion for a different day. And the, the gate oxide also has a geometric number, the thickness of the gate oxide, T ox. Um, on the semiconductor, we have a whole bunch of different properties. So we have the semiconductor doping, which is also called N sub, NA. NA refers to acceptor doping. That only applies to a P-type substrate. A lot of times this, uh, we just say N sub, meaning like the substrate doping. Uh, the semiconductor has a semiconductor work function, phi sub s. This is the distance between the Fermi level and the free electron level. The phi f is the distance between the Fermi level and the intrinsic level. That's what, what I just showed you on the previous slide. It has a band gap. And then it also has a dielectric um, constant. Okay, semiconductors, you know, they're partial conductors, partial insulators. So they, they can actually have a dielectric constant associated with them. And for silicon, it's in the range of 11. Okay, so we apply a gate voltage. I wanna look, uh, let's just study again uh, what is happening at inversion. You apply a positive gate potential, VGS, and we think about it being relative to the substrate because the substrate is also uh, connected to the source. The substrate or body is connected to the source, okay? So you build up positive charges on the gate, okay? And we're gonna call those positive charges QM. Q sub M, Q for charge, M means metal. There's, a, there's an electric field that goes through the gate oxide, through the thickness of the oxide. And the strongest electric field is going to be within the oxide. A little bit of that electric field is going to leak out into the semiconductor uh, down here, okay? And that is going to do two things. Is number one, it's gonna push away the holes Okay, and when you push away the holes, it leaves behind a depletion region. Melvin, you were asking this question before, will you form a depletion region? The answer is yes. You form a, a depletion region. Um, and in this depletion region, you have negatively charged immobile ions. I wanna emphasize that again, these are immobile ions. Remember when we studied PN junctions, that's a, there's a key difference between holes and electrons which can move and then the immobile ions, which are um, dopant ions, which are covalently bound to neighboring atoms. And just as a reminder, the way to think about it is that you have a p-type substrate. In the p-type substrate, you have the um, uh, column three uh, dopants. So they come with a hole, and then there's this negatively charged uh, nucleus. When the hole gets pushed away by this electric field, it leaves behind just the negatively charged ions. So that leaves an effective negative charge there. So there are negative charges here, but this does not make it n-type because these charges can't move. So they're not the same as having a, a, an electron concentration there, okay? All right, so that's the first thing it does. Now, um, so we can think about this depletion region having a depletion charge Q sub D. And then up here, just at the surface, you build up the, uh, you pull in the mobile electrons. Okay, these are the minority electrons that get pulled in from the p-type substrate and they, they build up just at the surface here, just at the surface here. And we call this Q sub S, referring to that as a surface charge. The surface charge is what creates the conductive channel, not Q sub D. Q sub S is the one that creates a thin conductive channel connecting the source and the drain. The source is on this side, the drain is on this side. Okay, so this is the key element that allows us to invert the semiconductor or that inverts the semiconductor. 
Okay, so now we're a little bit more quantitative. Um, uh, one thing I can tell you just from like the, the rules of capacitors is that you have to have equal amount of positive charge on the top end of the plate and equal amount of negative charge. So the total po positive and negative charge have to be equal. So the Q sub M is equal to the sum of QS and QD. The depletion region has a width associated and that is W sub D. Okay, so now that we have all our dimensions, now you get to throw all these equations at you. I'm going to try to make sense out of it now. Let's just go through this table one by one. Phi M is the metal work function. We talked about that already. Uh, epsilon oxide is the dielectric constant for the oxide for, SI, uh, for silicon dioxide, which is the common gate dielectric used in a lot of uh, semiconductors, or at least it was before. It's an, I guess you could say it's an older one now. Um, that has a relative dielectric constant of 3.8. Um, in the semiconductor substrate, we had the uh, dielectric constant for silicon. Uh, that is uh, usually around 11, the relative dielectric constant. So now for some formulas. Uh, the semiconductor doping factor, uh, keep in mind that phi F is not in electron volts, it's given in volts, in volts. And um, that can be calculated as KT over Q ln of N sub over NI. Remember that phi F is just the, um, phi F is the distance between EI and EF. Okay, but phi F, just the units for that is given in volts. Um, so I made a little mistake here. This should actually be KT over Q. Okay, and now that equation will line up with what I have on this slide here. Okay. So uh, um, KT over Q, ln of uh, NA over NI, if you have a P-type substrate. Next equation is the semiconductor work function of phi sub s. So phi sub s we know from before when we were looking at metal semiconductor junctions for uh, a p-type device it's, um, is chi sub s plus eg over two plus q times phi f. Let me give you a quick uh, visual of what that looks like. So if you look back at our uh, equilibrium band diagrams, So the semiconductor work function has three parts to it. One is chi sub s, this distance here. Then you have to add up this distance here, the distance between EC and EI. This is EG over two, the band gap divided by two, because EI is halfway between EC and EV. And then the last part is Q times phi f. So there's three parts to that equation. And those are the three parts that you see here. I sub s, eg over two plus q phi f. Now, if you have a PMOS device, the band diagrams are a little bit different and you can prove this to yourself, but this is a, actually, this turns out to be a negative sign because the Fermi level is above EI, not below it. Now we get into some, uh, some new things. The depletion width, the width of this area here is given by this equation two times the square root of epsilon s times phi f divided by q times n sub. Now you can see this is somewhat similar to the PN junction equations. We're not gonna go and, and derive this uh, just in the interest of time, okay? But you can see that there is a, um, it's dependent on the square root, the inverse of the square root of the substrate doping. Okay, so the depletion width can largely be controlled by the substrate doping. The substrate doping will change n sub it will also change phi f. Um, kind of a rule of thumb to remember when we were talking about PN junctions, we said higher doping means smaller depletion widths. And that same is true with, with this as well. Higher dopings will, will make a higher density of negative ions here. And that means that the width will end up being smaller. The total depletion charge is the width, depletion width uh, times the uh, doping density. So for an NMOS device, it's Q times NA times WD. 
And for a PMOS device, it's Q times ND. This is the substrate doping ND um, times WD. Remember, uh, just some signs to note here. In an NMOS device, the depletion charge is negative. So you can see these are all negative charges here. That's why there's a negative sign here. And for a PMOS device, these, uh, these ions, the depletion ions will be positive. So now that we have more of a, a quantitative look at what's going on, now we can do an electrostatic analysis of what's happening at inversion. So remember when we were talking about diodes, we did this, we did this exercise where we said, well, let's do an electrostatic analysis of the depletion region at equilibrium. We start out with this concept is we, we said, okay, we know the charge density. The charge density has a certain profile. From the charge density, we can integrate that to find the electric field. And then once we have the electric field, we can integrate that to find the, the potential distribution through the depletion region. And the result of doing that was that we were able to find an equation for the built-in potential and how it relates to the width of the junction. So we can do that same electrostatic analysis here for the MOSFET and gain some insights as to you know, wh where the electric fields are and what the potential distributions look like. So this is what the energy band diagram looks like at strong inversion. Remember, there's a, um, there's a strong amount of bending here. So these are where your electrons accumulate. Okay. And um, there's a sig significant amount of bending um, in the band diagram. The amount of bending here is equal to two times phi F. Okay, now, now we can look at um, uh, the charge electric field and potential. Let's start with the charge. So this first plot is showing you um, the charge distribution. Um, as we saw in the previous diagram, there's a bunch of positive charge right at the gate, okay? This is X. So just to give you a sense, the X dimension is going down this way from top to bottom. So as we go through this, uh, this thing, we see a bunch of positive charges that built up on the surface of the metal. And then through the oxide, we don't see any charges at all. Okay, through the oxide here, there are no charges at all. It's an insulating material, right? So the charges actually build up at the surface above and below the insulating material, not inside the material. So the charge density here is, is zero. And then once we get into the semiconductor, we have a bunch of negative charges. This is the surface charge. So we get into the semiconductor, we see a bunch of a high concentration of mobile electrons. And then we see a lower concentration of immobile ions. That's what we're seeing here. The inversion channel is just at this, at the very top surface, okay? Because mobile charges like to accumulate just at the interface between the, um, uh, uh, between the semiconductor uh, and the oxide. So this is a spike in the negative uh, charge uh, concentration. After that, you can see that there's a fixed charge. This looks very much like a PN junction. You remember how at the PN junction, you had like two rectangles, like one of positive charge and then one of negative charge. So this portion here, this depletion region looks like a PN junction, but you just have this additional surface charge here. Okay, just like a PN junction, you have a width, the width of the junction, a fixed, um, a fixed charge density, which came from the fixed doping. And so you have a total amount of negative charge, par partially due to the depletion region, partially due to the inversion channel. The total amount of, of negative charge here, the area under this curve has to equal the area here. Okay, this area and this area have to be equal to each other. So now from, from this plot, you can go to the electric field plot. The electric field plot is obtained by integrating, by integrating the uh, charge density plot, okay? 
And um, by the way, this is the last thing that we're going to cover here. <clears throat> so just maybe about five, five or 10 minutes here should be done. Now, when, when you integrate um, to find the charge density, the electric field from the charge density, um, you, have to, you have to take the integral of everything to the left of it. If, if you don't mind, I'm just going to bring up this slide again. Okay, I found it. Sorry about that. Okay, let me just do a quick screen screen share again. Okay. So we said that if we want to find the um, electric field from the charge, we have to integrate. So electric field is equal to one over epsilon the integral from negative infinity to point x uh, times rho of x dx. So what this means is that we integrate from negative infinity to some point x of the charge density. We're taking the integral of everything to the left of some point x. Okay, so based on that concept now, let's look at this. So, So if I'm here, the integral of everything to the left is, of course, zero. By the time I get here, between here and here, the integral, I'm going to start including the area of this rectangle here. So um, the electric field is suddenly going to shoot up like this. And that is indeed what is happening here the electric field goes very high. And this is the strong electric field within uh, the gate oxide. So when I'm integrating from here all the way to the origin here, there's no charge that I'm integrating. So there's no charge being added. That's why the electric field is a flat line like this. If you wanna think about it physically, in the gate oxide, there is a constant electric field throughout the thickness of the material. Once we get to once we get to the inversion channel, now all of a sudden we start having negative charge. Okay, so if I was to pick this point, for example, I have to include all this negative charge in addition to all this positive charge. And so they're gonna start to cancel each other out because there's some negative area and there's some positive area. So that's why you see that there's a sudden drop, there's a sudden drop in the electric field because all the surface charge is adding a lot of area, a lot of negative area, so it quickly brings down the electric field. And then the remainder, as you go through the rest of this, you're gonna see there's more and more negative area being added to the integral. So over that thickness, the electric field goes further and further down until it hits zero. Once you get out here, then you have negative area, and then you also have positive area and they, the two cancel each other out. And so the integral ends up being, sorry, the integral ends up being zero at this point, okay? So from the physical model, you can kind of think about it as there's, um, uh, there's a very strong electric field through the gate oxide. The, the electric field shoots up right at this interface. You have a strong electric field maintained through the gate oxide. Then there's a sudden drop in potential as you go through the inversion layer or suddenly sudden drop in the electric field as you go through the uh, inversion layer, and then a gradual drop in electric field as you go through the depletion region. Okay, sudden drop here and a more gradual drop here. And that's what you're seeing here. Um, the width of the depletion region, I showed this in the previous slide, but this is the, um, uh, this is the formula for the actual width of the depletion region. Now, finally, last concept is that we are gonna talk about the electrostatic potential. 
This is important because a lot of times with device designers, they'll talk about the potential drop across the oxide, the potential drop across the inversion channel, the potential drop across the depletion region. So we have to, we have to know what those terms mean, okay? So we start off by thinking like this is a, um, this is a voltage here, okay? This is at the positive voltage and this is zero. So there are going to be a bunch of voltage drops as we go from here down through the body, there's going to be a series of voltage drops, okay? Um, the voltage through the metal is going to be equal to VGS, okay? The metal is conductive, so the voltage here is the same everywhere, whatever you applied to it. Through the gate oxide, there's going to be a voltage drop because there's an electric field. Whenever you have an electric field, you have an associated, vo the voltage uh, changes as you go along the electric field. So the voltage drops across here. And then uh, we know that there's, um, there's an electric field in, in this region as well. So there's going to be a, a potential drop across the um, inversion channel. And there's also going to be a potential drop across the depletion region. And, um, and that will be it. So you can see here that the voltage starts off here. This is the applied VGS. Okay, once you get through the gate, um, once you get to the gate, the gate, the gate dielectric, you can see the voltage drops here fairly linearly. Okay, this is kind of like a straight line. Okay, um, when you have an electric field through um, a dielectric material, this is just an electromagnetics rule. If you have an electric field that goes through a dielectric material, if the dielectric material has like a, a uniform cross-sectional area and uniform properties, the electric field is also going to be um, constant through that material. And so you end up getting a linear voltage drop across that region, okay? And the voltage drop is referred to as VI in this diagram. This is the voltage drop across the gate oxide. There's a little bit of a voltage drop across the depletion region as well. Okay, so you can kind of see here that uh, there's a, a decreasing electric field in uh, the uh, um, depletion region. If you integrate the electric field, you end up getting voltage potential. So this is a straight line. If you integrate a straight line, you get a parabola. And so you end up getting um, a parabolic decrease in the voltage potential here, okay? Um, they're showing this finally, the, this last point here is phi sub s is the, um, the voltage drop across the semiconductor uh, substrate. And just so you have a sense for tying this back to the energy band diagram, the last point I'm gonna make here is strong inversion is defined, um, we define strong inversion in this diagram here. And we said this is Q phi S. Phi S is the amount of bending in the band diagram. Now don't get this phi S uh, mixed up with uh, the semiconductor work function. The semiconductor work function is also phi capital S. I don't know why the book does it this way, but uh, the semiconductor work fun function is given by this formula. Phi, phi small S is how much bending there is in the band diagram. This is equal to two phi F at a uh, strong inversion. And this is the voltage drop within the semiconductor. Q phi S represents the voltage drop within the semiconductor. And that lines up with the phi S that you see here. This is, so I'll just label that. This is the voltage. drop across the gate oxide. And this is the voltage drop across the semiconductor depletion region. Okay. All right. So we covered quite a bit of material here. We're just at the end of class. Um, any questions?
The typical things I would expect you to know, um, just for you know, practical practical cases, is that um, I would like you to be able to calculate phi sub f, phi sub s, the width of the depletion region, uh, calculate the depl depletion charge, and so on. Um, I'm not going to ask you to derive um, the electric fields and charge densities and electrostatic potentials, but I would like you to be at least familiar with what the shape of these diagrams uh, look like and you know, generally where they came from. You know, we, we went through this very qualitatively, where the charges are, where the potential drops are, and so on. That's the type of thing I'd, I would um, want you to know, you know, type short answer type questions. Um, the quantitative type questions would be things like, you know, calculating the currents for certain uh, modes of operation, drawing the energy band diagrams. Those ones we, we went through quite in detail, so I would expect you to be able to draw those. And next time in class, we'll cover threshold voltages and uh, being able to calculate the threshold voltage for a MOSFET. Okay, that's something we'll cover on Monday. All right, uh, so if there's no additional questions, I think we can um, end the recording here. And uh, I'll see you all on, on Monday. Thanks. All right. Thank you.